Welcome to the SBI Podcast, offering CEOs, sales and marketing leaders ideas to make the number. Welcome SBI Podcast listeners and video podcast viewers. My name is Andrew Ortiaga. With me is co-host Drew Karen, and we're principals at SBI, a sales and marketing consultancy dedicated to helping you make the number. This is the weekly SBI podcast, and its purpose is to share insights and information relevant to your business. But before we get started, an interesting fact about myself and co-hosts, besides the same first names, is we both hold black belts in the martial arts. Drew Karen here, my sidekick, actually got his black belt by reading Black Belt by Dummies. No, I'm just kidding. He actually spent 27 years in the martial arts and myself 17 years. And what this means to you is that if we can't agree on a topic, we're going to settle it in a cage fight for our TV viewers. Yeah, I'd be careful. Sometimes when you mess with the bull, you get the horn. (laughs) So we're going to jump right into the show. We'll be reviewing a classic today, Spin Selling by Neil Rackman. The book was originally published in 1988, Drew. What the heck were you doing in 1988? I don't think our audience wants to know that. Okay, so let me give you a couple fun facts. The top song in 1988 was George Michael, Faith, and the top movie was by Tom Hanks, Big. Do you remember watching those? Or you, you cranked that music up. Are you going to tell us you had Wham posters on your <laughs> wall, too, when you were growing up? Very Before we nice. get back to the show. Touche, touche. <laughs> Just to remind the audience, spin selling is an acronym of four different types of sales questions that can take a disinterested prospect to someone who's motivated to buy. So the questions are S stands for situation questions, P is the problem questions, I is the implication questions, and the N is the need payoff questions. Yeah, and it's and it's awesome, right? So the spin selling process was developed and following careful observations of 35,000 sales calls carried out by professional sales experts too. From the observations, it became clear that the quality of the questions asked by a salesperson were key to whether or not the sale was actually closed. For example, the right question could speed up the process, whereas the wrong question could completely stall it or even eliminate it uh, overall. The spin selling process and sales techniques were laid out a sequence of questioning types designed to build the rapport, understand the needs, and increase the closure rates. I don't know about you, but back in the day, I was in the copy industry. I mean, this was the Bible. This is what everybody did. And it did help me get a couple deals across the table. Yeah, absolutely. Made a lot of money using this process. But the question is, how does it apply today? That was 1988, probably valuable through a decade, maybe even 15 years inside of sales organizations. And how does the process like spin or maybe even any other process like Miller Hyman and strategic selling, some of these other concepts, how does it fit into how sales organizations want their sales professionals to interact with their prospects and and customers? Yeah, well, it's no secret that every organization wants to improve win rates, you know, raise their ASP, increase their customer lifetime value, right? But it's a question of how can they do it, right? So common sense dictates a sales process can help you achieve those goals. I can't tell you how many times I've heard, if I can just get my sales team to follow a process from start to finish, yeah. I can maximize the performance. Hear right? it all the time. So ideally, the rep's guiding the buyer through the journey all the way through it, right? But my question is around the agility of the sales process. How does it take into consideration reps who sell into different categories, different processes, different types of products, software versus services, you know, multiple buyer decisions too? This is where it really comes back in. And you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen these days. Yeah, I agree. I really agree with you here. If it, the, the, the caution here or the mistake that people could make is you take a cookie cutter approach. Right. Sales reps have a, a tendency to apply a linear approach to their sales process. Take a prospect from point one through point five or six of that sales process. And typically when you do that, in today's environment and buyers and how they make a purchasing decision is you can cause misalignment between the buyer and the seller. And the sales process has got to match that, right, in order to drive a buying decision. In addition, it begins with deploying a sales strategy. So if you start bringing initiatives like, hey, let's, let's implement a sales process, you have to think through how does that change what we're trying to accomplish in our overall sales strategy, meaning are we pursuing new logos, are we trying to drive more revenue from the account base? Right. Are we trying to cross-sell, upsell, whatever the initiative might be? And then ensuring that it aligns with the overall objectives of the organization is the other point. There was a quote in the book that I 
uh, I liked when I read it, which was people do not buy from salespeople because they understand their products, but because they felt the salesperson understood their problems. So to me, here's what, where the disconnect is really happening. Right. Today's buyer, anywhere you search on the internet, they're more informed than ever before. Right. Some people, you know, wherever you look it up on Google, different statistics, but it's anywhere of upwards of 60% of that purchasing decision has already been made before they come in contact with a right. seller, right? But the book is saying, hey, ask these questions, find out what the problems are of these buyers. In today's environment, that might not work. They don't have the time or the patience. They expect you to come to a sales call already knowing those things. And we spoke a little bit about this earlier. Yeah, and, and you're right. I think that the, when you look at that, understanding that the buyer is going to go through 60% of the entire buyer journey before they ever want to engage a salesperson. So the first opportunity a salesperson has to start to try to steer that process or differentiate themselves from the competition happens way down the line, right? Agreed. I mean, think about it. If you didn't have to deal with a salesperson on your purchases, you wouldn't, right? I don't. So what you have to think about is how do we affect that decision earlier in the process, right? So it comes down to content marketing and a lot of the other things, but it really all starts with market research, right? So defining and understanding, you know, what the markets are. You have to know what markets you want to play in. Mm -hmm. Specifically, you have to have an understanding of which accounts will generate the most revenue for you over the shortest period of time. Mm -hmm. You know, and you also need to understand inside those accounts which buyers and how do those particular buyers make their purchasing decisions. So these three component parts are what we call market research, and they feed everything across, mm -hmm. right? So they feed the corporate strategy, they feed the marketing strategy, they feed the sales strategy, mm -hmm. right? The product strategy, all of these are keyed in from there too. And this is what I thought I felt was missing from the book itself. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Drew. So why don't we take a short break to let our listeners and viewers hear about some of the new offerings at SBI. When we jump back into the octagon, Drew and I, are gonna let our listeners know how to align market research to your sales strategy. Making your number is hard. Your problems are complex. Complex problems need complex solutions. Introducing the SBI Magazine. Read in-depth stories written by award-winning journalists about how your peers have overcome their problems to make the numbers. When you need more than a tweet, social post, or blog article, turn to the SBI Magazine. Go to salesbenchmarkindex.com to subscribe. Welcome back. I'm Andrew Urtiaga of SBI, and with me is Drew Karen, also of SBI. Today, we're trying to help you make your 2016 number by discussing how to align your sales strategy to the external market. Before we went on the break, we were stress testing the spin selling methodology to today's environment. Then we shifted focus on how to have a deep understanding of your customers in order to increase your probability of success during the, buy, the buying cycle. Let us keep going. Why not just take this approach through and tweak it to make it work for today? Customize it to make it buyer centric. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. But first, I think what we should do is slow down a bit and let our listeners understand the importance of actually having a sales process. But more important, it's the alignment within your sales strategy. So let's take a quick look just for a second at what is a sales strategy. A sales strategy is really an operating plan for the company's sales force, right? What does a sales strategy do? Well, a sales strategy allocates the sales resources efficiently to drive selling costs down and revenues up. But what does it mean to use a sales strategy? The use of a sales strategy really means the ex that the sales executive will get the most out of his or her sales force. In order to grow revenues organically, there are five steps that will enable you to properly define your sales strategy. The first is really planning, right? <clears throat> so planning is developing a sales and data plans that allow the organization to make the number, mm -hmm. right? Engagement's the second step, which we define as the process which sets the sales teams and how they interact with both prospects and customers. Third is going to be the organization, right? To make sure the org structure is set up properly and correctly so the right people are in the right roles to execute the process. <clears throat> the fourth is actually execution. It always comes down to execution. This is doing the part and focusing on the things like sales enablement, pipeline, forecast management, the things that actually matter, right? And the last is support. So it's helping the sales team be effective in perpetuity by supporting them and making it easy internally to do business with the organization. 
Yeah, I really like that. And strategy comes down <clears throat> about making choices, right? Taking some risks, but making the right choices. And if we take what we learned about the market research and align that with what we're trying to accomplish in our sales strategy, we will gain better understanding of how buyers want to buy and how we want to align our selling activities to those buyers. And then we can point our resources in the right direction. And at the end of the day, it's about increasing the probability of success, right? Every time a seller goes out there, it's about putting them in the right position and with the greatest probability of success and the, less, the least level of effort in terms of right. closing those opportunities. Yeah, and that's why I love the book from a sales process and questioning and customer interaction basis. If you ask me, hey, how is this book best served? The book's best served when it's belly to belly, right? right? When I have those interactions with the customer, I'm asking good questions, I'm getting there too. But as we've discussed, it's much more than that. And that's where we differ a little bit too. I think this is too tunnel focused right in the middle and we're not looking at the broader picture. Yeah, that's a great point, Drew. The, the other thing I wanna add here that's important for our audience is the concept of active and latent demand. Yeah. <clears throat> so many times, as I mentioned before, or earlier in our show, is that the buyer, excuse me, sellers, sometimes tend to drive a linear process, right? They yeah. always wanna take the same approach with the buyer, whether a prospect or a customer, and they wanna take them through steps one through five. The other thing to take into consideration when engaging with buyers is this concept of active and latent demand. Active demand is when the customer or the prospect is coming to us actively and saying, I got a problem, I need you to solve it, you've right. got the products and the services, right? And then latent demand is when the seller actually creates the opportunity, right? Challenges the status quo of that customer or that prospect. And that's important to know, and I think there's value in Neil's set of questions when driving what we call latent demand, mm -hmm. but there is a misalignment when it's active demand, right? The, the buyer is further down the line, has understood what their problems are, they've already gone out, researched it, and have a concept and an idea of how they wanna solve for it. Yeah. So really there, it's more aligning features and benefits. Right, right. well, where you're, where you're kinda of going with that too is if you come in and you're doing the probing questions at that point too, you're showing you're already disconnected from the buyer because they're in a different place and you're trying to take them back and they're like, okay, he's not listening to me, he's just running a sales process. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And I see what you mean because if you look at this and you talk about you know, selling in enterprise accounts or mining the cu current customer base, going in and asking those good probing questions to drive up latent demand seems like it's got a perfect place. Okay. But you know what I was also just thinking about too is you have to think in the era when, when this book was written. Right, that was the era of here's your list, bang the phones, you're gonna make 100 phone calls and everybody's gonna go in there and it was you know, bare knuckles you know, prospecting and just slamming in the cold calling. Yeah, Th that, I agree. And, and, that's and, not today. And, and not only that, back then in 1988, the customer, right, and the internet has caused this shift, right, but the customer depended on sellers to educate them. Yep. Right, on the products and services. Correct. Today, they're not needed. Yeah. I mean, think about how we buy a car today, right? right? We can go in there. We've taken this entire sales cycle, spending the entire day. You go in the morning to try to buy a car, and you feel like you got beat up because you're driving home finally with the car when the sun's setting. Right. Today, you can search the price. You can get all the, the bells and whistles that you want. You can look up the invoice. You can basically walk into the dealership and say, here's the car that I want, the color that I want it in, with the features that I want, and here's the cost that I'm willing to pay above. Right. Right, and that sales cycle has completely shrunk. Right. Same applies here in the B2B world. Well, and studies have shown that the more transparent and more information you give on your webpage to the buyers when they're in their journey too, mm -hmm. the higher win rates that you have as well too. So what you did is you tied that together perfectly too. You see where it works so effectively here, but we have to go out and apply it to the broader market research, building in the demands all the way through that too. So when absolutely. we actually get into the sales process, we can execute a good sales process. Yeah, Excellent point too. So we're gonna take another break right here. And we stick around because when we come back, we'll discuss one more critical step to ensure your sales methodology is in alignment with your sales strategy. Do you have too many things to do and not enough time to do them? Is finding time to learn best practices almost impossible? The SBI podcast is your solution. Turn time spent exercising, commuting, and traveling into productive learning time with a subscription to the SBI podcast. 
SBI podcast listeners get unique insight into real-world sales and marketing issues through interviews with your industry peers every week. Find us on iTunes by searching for Sales Benchmark Index Podcast and subscribe today. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Drew Kieran of SBI, and with me, my co-host, Andrew Urtiaga of SBI. Today, we're trying to help you make your 2016 number by discussing how to align your sales process to your sales strategy while staying aligned with the external market. At the end of the day, we all want to deploy a sales process, right? Tailored to how your buyers want to buy to improve win rates, deal sizes, and then shorten the sales cycle. But to get this answer, you've got to go in and ask several questions, right? So how do I understand what the buyer wants from us as a whole at the later stages of the decision process? So that's exactly what you were talking about yeah. before the break, too. The second thing is, what differs? how does that differ from one segment to the other? What about accounts? Right? Mm -hmm. You know, enterprise or SMB, right? All of those factors come back into play. And second is, if I know that, how will I know these buyers are exiting one stage and entering the next one, right? What's the defined criteria to move from one stage to the other stage? And by the way, it's got to be buyer driven that right. actually moves it from one to the other two. And finally, how do we turn the buyer interest into a purchasing decision? So this is how we kind of started off the show. Let me see if you're paying attention. What's the answer to that question? I'm sorry? No. The answer is market research. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and to take it a step further, Drew, I, I think it's not only the market research. I mean, that is the foundation in which the house is built right. from a strategy perspective. But then think about all the different products that people are building and launching or organizations are building and launching. Are these all going to be sold the same way? Yeah. Right? Are the sales cycles you know, going to be longer? Are these transactional sales? Are these additive products? How are they going to be sold? And so I think it's not as easy as just taking a one-size-fits-all approach and saying, here's how we're going to sell it. Because I think what you're going to find is this trial and error where you're going to have people trying to go sell the product, sellers trying to go sell the product, and they're going to fail. Right? And they're going to have some pockets of success that they're going to cling on. And then what happens is, Salespeople are opportunistic. Sure. They take the path of least resistance. Yeah, absolutely. They're going to sell the products that they feel more comfortable with, but the ones that they're most successful at selling as well. And then let's take it from a marketing perspective. Then that demand's being generated for these products. And you know, each opportunity that I get from, depending on what segment it comes from, those people don't all buy the same way. Right? And the buyers inside these accounts have different titles, different objectives, different obstacles. So you gotta take all those things into consideration. And I think the key word here is customization. Mm -hmm. How do you customize your sales process, but more importantly, how do you, how do you align it with the sales strategy? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, but I also wanna bring up a couple points too. So when you were talking just a minute ago too, one of the things that it made me think about was the era in which the book was written. And that was almost when, hey, we're going to build a better mousetrap, and then by pure executing a better sales process, we're going to sell more. It kind of ignored what the market was asking for and how to do it. I don't want to say it's a ramming down your throat approach, right. but that's kind of what it is as well, too. The other thing that changed dramatically that was just exactly what you were talking about was it's not now just a single sole purchaser. Right. There's buying decision teams, right? Most recent surveys say it's 5.4 people involved in the buying decision all with different needs, different challenges, fears, concerns that all have to be addressed. And guess what? They can't be addressed if you're just plowing down the thing with you know one direction down, no turn stops off the highway. Right, absolutely, I agree. So when you're talking about all that, it kind of teed up perfectly what we're talking about, about the six-step revenue growth methodology, right? Tying it all together, right? And I think this is where we are a little bit different than what's in the book too. Excellent points they made about executing within a sales strategy, right. but that's actually taking a very narrow view in what we know to be a much broader solution, right? So the first is market research. I mean, you have to understand what your buyers want, how your users use the products, mm -hmm. your accounts, so you can properly differentiate yourself from everybody else, right? Second is the corporate strategy. It's really the best way to define corporate strategy would be the proper allocation of people, money, and time in the mm -hmm. pursuit of profitable revenue, right? From there, and this is what you were hitting on a minute ago, it ties into the product strategy. Product strategy uses the input from market research to build products that the market, to solve a market concern, but also that the market is willing to pay for. Agreed. Right? Yep. And then marketing 
is this exactly what we talked about earlier too when we talked about the buyer journey and how far down the process they're going. If they're completing 60% of the buyer journey before they want to engage a salesperson, mm -hmm. it's extremely critical that marketing gets it right. And so how we define the marketing strategy is it's really about driving demand for our products and services. And then sales, I think that's the easy part. I honestly do, right? Sales is actually just taking that demand and converting it to revenue. Mm -hmm. And then the one component we didn't talk about yet is the talent piece, right? So we've talked before about, you know, is a 50-50 equal quota, right? 50% performance conditions, but also 50% talent, right? right? You put an A player in C performance conditions, you're gonna end up with a C player. Yeah. You take you know, a C player and put them in an A player's you know, performance conditions, you're still gonna end up with a C player, right? So it's, uh, talent drives it, right? And it's getting the people that can execute the strategy in place. Yeah, there's a lot there that you said, and I think uh, if our audience is listening or, or watching this show, it, it can get pretty complicated. So let's give them a little uh, guidance for our listeners in, in terms of what they can do to stress test their strategy. Yep, great idea. I think what they should do is download the 2016 SBI research report and read pages four through 14. That's the executive summary. And then flip over to page 32 and review with your other functional leaders. These questions highlight the six step revenue growth methodology we've discussed today. Okay, Drew, for the big question, is the book a pretender or a contender? You know, it's definitely a contender, right? And I think previously, 20 years ago, it was the champ. But I think it needs a fresh coat of paint to align itself with the current buyer. Yeah, so what does this all mean for the audience? And I agree with you. Well, what it means is you can't make your number if you don't have strategic alignment throughout the organization, right? That's why you care. So if you wanna make sure that you get this right, get a copy of this year's research report called How to Make Your Number in 2016 at Sales Benchmark Index forward slash 2016 dash report. If you feel you might not be in strategic alignment, you can have one of our experts lead you through a workshop, which will detail how to do this at salesbenchmarkindex.com forward slash 2016 dash workshop. And you can register for the workshop there. Yeah, true. Really appreciate it. Thanks for going the rounds with me and I hope the audience enjoyed it. Yeah, it was awesome. Thanks very much. I also want to thank you, our audience, for tuning in. This show has become very popular, and with this popularity comes the opportunity to discuss great topics like we did today. So until next time, we wish you much success as you try and make your number. This has been the SBI Podcast. For more information on SBI services, case studies, the SBI team and how we work, or to subscribe to our other offerings, please visit us at salesbenchmarkindex.com.